Up next on Eco Company. Rescuing duck eggs, combing the rice fields for hidden eggs. There's a row of people just like holding on to a rope, shaking it. They're scaring up the hens to find their eggs yeah, before the mowers one. cut the crop. Then, looking for foxes. But this fox can only be found on Santa Cruz Island. The island fox was put on the endangered species list in 2004. It's pretty awesome what they're doing right now. Teens spending the summer on the island, helping to protect the Santa Cruz Island fox. Then, creatures hidden in the sand. Crabs may sound boring, but they actually play a really big role in the ecosystem. These teens are digging them up. We'll find out why they're so important and why they're keeping tabs on them. All that and more on Eco Company. Starting right now. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to Eco Company. I'm Riley. And I'm Miles. If you spend any time out in the countryside, you probably notice that farms attract a lot of wildlife. And in Northern California, there are a lot of ducks. They use cover crops as a nesting place. This can be disastrous to a farmer when he needs to till his field. But we found one farm that's made a tradition out of helping these eggs before that happens. They call it egg aid. It's a bright, sunshiny day in Northern California, and these kids are all smiles. That's because today, they're in Mother Nature's classroom at Lundberg Family Farms. Here at the farm, we do grow 17 varieties of rice. Lars Lundberg says sustainability is in this family's DNA. We've been doing it since 1937, focused on organic, just with uh, using water as the main weed controller, and then disking the, the crop back in instead of burning it, and growing cover crops and rotating the rice on and off. Cover crops also lay out the welcome mat for wildlife, one kind in particular. What animals are nesting in the fields? Yeah, ducks, yeah, exactly. The cover crop is dense, so it protects the nest from predators. But according to Jessica Lundberg, it creates a problem when it's time to work the field. When we go in to plant a rice crop in the spring, we have to chop the cover crops and start and work the soil. That cover crop is a beautiful habitat for wildlife, a great habitat for birds that are looking for nesting areas at the same time that we're trying to get ready to farm a rice crop. That's where these fifth graders from Chico, California come in. So what you guys are gonna do is help us find those eggs and save them before the mowers come in and mow the cover crop. Here on the farm, they call it egg aid. It's older than I am. It's been out here for 25 years, but ever since I can remember, since so the springtime we go out and scare up the, the hens and collect the eggs. So after a quick briefing, it's go time. Their job, along with volunteers from the District 10 Wild Duck Egg Salvage Program, is to form a line and walk the fields. Well, we went along um, holding a line up with tin cans on it with rocks, and we shook it. There's a row of people just like holding onto a rope, shaking it. We'd scare the ducks up, and wherever they went, we would go around there and um, look for their nests. I think it's right around here. We'd shake it to make the mother birds fly away, and then we'd pick up the eggs and put them in a egg present. Even so, spotting the nest isn't always easy. Oh my gosh! Okay, I see something. Here! There's one over there too! We would all race over there to where we saw the bird go up. It's warm. Have you done one? It's a warm. Are they? They'd find a nest and they'd pick up the egg and they'd say it's warm. These birds are actually living out here. They don't go home to a house or they don't have some shelter. They actually are, are eating and drinking and flying and making their nests and hatching babies out here. Wow, this is a pretty big deal. When the day's done, it's time for the count. Kind of uh, grouping the eggs together. There's three different nests here. There's a nest of three, and a nest of one, and another nest of three. All together, we found 53. We call that egg-tastic. I thought it was pretty nice, just saving the little eggs. Um, it feels really good because you know you're saving uh, some ducks' lives. Well, I think it was fun and it was a good thing to do because we're helping the animals and 
since we're, if we're destroying their homes, we should at least kind of help them by saving them. I think each one of us wants to do the best we can. You can really make a difference. That, uh, for me as a kid, was kind of fun message growing up. It's a message these kids are learning too. One egg at a time. Over the years, they have rescued, hatched, and released back into the wild over 26,000 ducks. Wow, that's an amazing number and a great story. Up next, we have another story of success. Not long ago, the small Santa Cruz Island fox was nearly extinct. But it's on its way back thanks to the Nature Conservancy. One group of teens got to spend their summer on the island to learn all about it. Adam and Jordan joined them looking for foxes. stay over here and then hike this whole ridge and just come over here. So, you guys ready to head off? Yeah. yeah. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Their high schoolers from the big city transplanted to the great outdoors. These teens are among dozens nationwide taking part in LEAF. It stands for the Leaders in Environmental Action for the Future program run by the Nature Conservancy. Tell us about that program. So the LEAF program is super exciting. It's a highly competitive summer internship program where we take urban youth kids, bring them out to our nature preserves, um, couple them up with our scientists, where they get to learn green job skills and do lots of conservation work. High schoolers Kiera Adams and Ashley Rios are among a group of Southern California teens who are here for a month-long adventure. So I decided to apply for this program so I could get the experience of being outdoors for a month on a secluded island with like um, seven other girls from our school. I wanted to come here to get like a new experience because I'm like a little city girl and I have never been in nature this long for a whole month. Today these paid interns are heading out into the rugged terrain to learn more about efforts to save the endangered Santa Cruz Island fox. So I was thinking from here we go. TNC can... biologists Adam Dillon and Christy Bozer are heading up the field crew. I'm really excited to have the Leaf Girls out here, learning more about them, where they come from, and seeing them experience the nature that we have out here is a treasured experience for me. Hiking boots on. Ready? All right. The entire area is mapped out grid by grid, and getting to our locations takes a bit of legwork, to put it lightly. Yeah, it's a big adventure huge adventure. They'll be experiencing a fox capture event wherein we will uh, check the fox for any health problems. We'll be vaccinating them against uh, certain canine diseases. The goal here is to make sure the fox population is healthy and to keep tabs on their numbers. The island fox was put on the endangered species list in 2004. Uh, we're on track for uh, getting them off the endangered species list within a couple of years. After a short hike, it doesn't take long to spot our first critter of the day. But definitely not the one we expected. Well, it looks like they ran into a skunk. Ew, do you think they got sprayed? Back on the mainland, the skunks are like bigger, or like yeah. in yeah. movies, they have a giant it's white very smelly. Yeah. Yeah. I guess we'll find out in the next segment. And later, hidden creatures underneath the sand. Crabs may sound boring, but they actually play a really big role in the ecosystem. They're so Why they're so important, and how are. these teens are keeping tabs on them. There's a lot more eco companies still to come. Okay, let's get back to the Santa Cruz Island where the Nature Conservancy's leaf interns are looking for the island fox. When we last left them, they had just found a new critter. A skunk. Did they get sprayed? Let's find out. It's a perfect afternoon for a skunk sighting on Santa Cruz Island off the California coast. The skunks are pretty rare these days. It's a joy when we find one. We're hanging out with the Nature Conservancy and teens from LEAF, its environmental program for high school students. They're helping researchers preserve and protect the island and its species. They're looking out for the Santa Cruz Island fox and anything else that comes their way. These island skunks, they don't smell as bad as the skunks that you have in your neighborhood. Uh, these guys have a little foxy odor to them and a little less skunky odor, um, and they're not quite as bad to handle. Lucky for us, this one left as a happy camper. So you guys weren't really disappointed to see a skunk in place of a fox, huh? 
No, we don't really see. We've been here a couple days and we haven't really seen a skunk here on the island. We're used to seeing foxes all the yeah. time. And back on the mainland, the skunks are like bigger or like yeah. in yeah. movies, they have a giant it's white very smelly. Yeah. Yeah. You spray smelly. everywhere. Like no. the chances yeah. of not getting sprayed when you see a skunk yeah. on the mainland is so rare, but <laughs> yeah. we survived this one. Yeah, we did. We did, we did. we're good. <laughs> now back to the matter at hand keeping tabs on the endangered Santa Cruz Island fox. These foxes are really small. They're about four pounds only. So that's a lot smaller than your average house cat. The workup kit is ready, and we don't have to wait long to find one. But it's a delicate situation, so the leaf teens must keep their distance. So right now we're masking the fox um, to try and limit his uh, stress level. If they're not seeing what's going on, it tends to be a little bit more calming for them. Foxes are vaccinated and tagged with a microchip, then get a physical. We also take a flea comb to him, and we have a protocol where we swipe three times down each side and check for fleas. This is again just to make sure that the fox is healthy. Um, we got one little flea in here. A bite bar is used so biologists can give them a dental checkup. This is our humane way of getting them to open their mouths so we can look at the teeth, make sure that there is nothing wrong um, in there. Detailed records are kept on every animal's condition. He's looking pretty good, the eyes look clear, um, parasite load is good, he's pretty healthy and he's definitely feisty and ready to get going. So we are going to let him go. Okay, so we found our first fox of the day. Uh, was it a pup or an adult? I couldn't really tell. I don't have a frame of reference. <laughs> this was a young male. He was uh, kind of a juvenile stage, not quite a puppy, but a, a nice adult. He didn't have his canines in, so he's gonna work on getting those in. All of these efforts aren't lost on the leaf crew. They have to keep them healthy, so it's pretty awesome what they're doing right now. Biologist Adam Dillon is a two-year veteran of the project. Well, it's nice seeing them getting all excited. They're out there hiking right now. You know, this is kind of an amazing island. It's really near, you know, L.A. You know, to get out here and see how wild things are and also to be able to see just different endangered species, how the ecosystem works on the island is really a pretty incredible place to be. We come across several more foxes on the hike. Each gets a workup and all are looking good. So are their overall numbers across the island. Their populations have grown from an estimated uh, 85 individuals in 2002 to over 1,200 individuals today. It's proof ecologist efforts to save the endangered fox are working, something these teens appreciate. I think it's important to save these endangered uh, species, which is the, the fox here on the island, so it's important to keep this population ongoing. What a show! From one great adventure to another. And up next, tiny crabs hidden in the sand. We'll find out what that's about when we come back. More Eco Company is still ahead. So what do you do on a chilly, breezy day at the beach? If you're the teens we're about to meet, you get wet. But what's a little cold water when it's in the name of science? It's all in the morning's work for these guys. This isn't what many people think of as a typical day at the beach. Seven. But it is for these guys. They're high school students and careers in science interns at the California Academy of Sciences. It's a multi-year education program for budding scientists. Today, interns like Jasmine Petway are on the hunt for something hidden beneath the sand. And that's these little guys, the Pacific Mole Crab. What exactly do you have right there? Um, you got a big this one? is a big sand crab. It's uh, 26 millimeters. Wow. And there's a female without it. We get to go out and uh, dig for sand crabs every Wednesday, and I've been doing that for two summers now. And if that water looks chilly, that's because it is. The water is pretty cold, but I mean, after a few minutes, your feet kind of get numb and then you get used to it. Christian Paz doesn't mind braving the cold in the name of research. Oh yeah, for science, everything's worth it. <laughs> Their job here? To find out how healthy the sand crab population is along the stretch of coastline. Crabs may sound boring, but especially off the coast of California, um, they actually play a really big role in the ecosystem. They're at the bottom of the food chain, so they are really super important. Um, sea lions eat them, birds eat them. Surf perch is the top predator in this ecosystem, hmm. but over 90% of its diet is these sand crabs alone. 
So this could affect the entire food chain if they are wiped out or anything. Right. And so by collecting this data, we want to do it not just over one year, but over many, many years mm -hmm. so that we can have this record of um, data. Gigapaths. During the summer, interns take 50 samples a week. First, they do a transect to narrow down their study area. Then it's down to business. Kylie Wong and Hadrian Kwan the title height are project supervisors. Two meters and rising. We take these, what are called cores, they're just a little uh, cylinder. We dig them into the ground, and when we haul these cores out of the ground, we sort of sift through all the sand we find, and we look at the sand crabs we collect. Wow, there are so many. They're doing two things. Nine are. Measuring how big they are, and also determining if they're male or female. So what do you have right there? So here we have a sand crab with eggs. So wow, it's big. bright orange. So those are all the eggs, right? Yep. And so is it a good thing to see these eggs? I mean, then you know that they're reproducing and then, right? Yes. Yeah. Generally the sign of a healthy population when you find at least a few females with eggs. We have to measure every single one that's above 10. Eric Godoy manages the careers and science program and makes sure these guys have the tools they need. And what's great about these youth is that they're so engaged with science and doing so much to really understand the natural world around them. It's not a study that happens overnight. The Academy's been keeping tabs out here for eight years and counting. What's critical to a monitoring program is we're seeing what changes are happening over a long period of time. And in that time, uh, we've noticed up until actually this year, a really big decline in the number of sand crabs. This year, we haven't found many. A couple years ago, we had found 10 of these a day, each week. It's time to pack things up at the beach, but the work doesn't end there. Next, it's back to intern headquarters at the academy to make their findings official. They enter all their stats into a Sandy Beach long-term monitoring database. It's a project of the Farallons Marine Sanctuary Association. So this is very important um, data that we've been able to provide for many other institutions. So that data gets put into like the larger picture. And so it's kind of cool that like us as youth can contribute to like the scientific community. After that, they're still not done. Next up, it's a turn on the academy floor, where interns educate the public about climate change and global warming. That's actually one of the major parts of our, you know, what we talk about on the public floor, what interns are basically taught to teach to a lot of visitors. One of the aspects that we think is important for the Christian Science Program is to really educate these youth about climate change and the impact that it has on life. It's really, really good for kids who might be from the city and they might not know of these problems, but they um, come out and they learn a lot and so they're ready to teach other people about them. So whether it's inside or out, their mission is to explore, explain, and protect the world around us all. The more information we have, the more we can really understand about the world. And our goal is to propel them into that science career and it's fantastic to see them get so engrossed by the process of science and by um, really doing a lot of the activities that a professional scientist would do. And also it's really good for youth to be involved because this is what's happening to us and I mean it might sound corny but we are the future. <laughs> and as the saying goes, the future is what we make of it. A while back, we did a story on the conservation efforts at the Oakland Zoo. They have wonderful programs around the world and at home at the zoo. But there's one recycling program at the zoo that we couldn't quite fit into a story. I guess you could say it's a gift from the animals. Well, sort of. Majestic and exotic animals, big and small. They're all here at the Oakland Zoo, and they all have one thing in common. They produce a usable byproduct. Yep, you guessed it. When you think of the zoo, you don't think about poop, but the animals we have here at the zoo generate a lot of it. The keepers responsible for maintaining the animals rake it from the yard every day, and it's grounds manager Matt Lacombe's job to do something with it. We process it and try to reuse and recycle it as much as we can. Once we drop off our raw product into our raw pile, and then we take our bobcat and we load the raw product into our scrap machine. 
and on the inside of the scrapper we have little bits and rotary, rotary blades that rotate. It just breaks down everything and mixes it all up so it can come out to a nice fine product. Then it goes in here. It's called the ag bag. It looks like a very large snake, but there's rich compost cooking in there. Once it's been mixed up by a scrapper, we put it into our ag bag machine, this green machine right here. What this machine does, this machine um, condenses everything into the ag bag. The ones to the right here um, are the ones that are actually finished, so those bags are actually getting hot air blown into it. The hot air, along with natural microbes, heat up the mixture to kill pathogens, making the compost safe for use. What we're looking for is a temperature of um, 150 plus degrees. After the compost is cooked for the right amount of time, it's put to good use. We put it out into the field, into our gardens, into our landscape um, to enrich the zoo. Well, that wraps up this week on Eco Company. Thanks for tuning in. For more information on these stories or to give us your feedback, visit eco-company.tv. And remember, you too can be a part of the solution. We'll see you back here next time on Eco Company.